Oh, it's warm. Cheers, Todd. Alright, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my February wrap-up, which is why I'm wearing a suit. I have my top button undone for now, though, because it's hot. Maybe I'll do it up, I don't know. Let's do it up for a bit, see how we get on. But it is very warm in here, so please bear with me. I read 36 books in February because I was a bit of a beast. A lot of these were shorter ones, like my Penguin Mini Black Classics. But um, yeah, let's just get straight into it. So... Book number one, we have Penguin Little Black Classic number nine, uh, Three Tang Dynasty Poets. So the blurb here, pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. So to give you a feel for what you're in for here, I'm going to read your poem. I'm going to read uh, Lament by the Riverside by Tu Fu. The old man from Shaoling, weeping inwardly, slips out by stealth in spring and walks by serpentine and on its riverside sees the locked palaces, young willows and new reeds, all green for nobody, where rainbow banners once went through south gardens, gardens and all therein with merry faces. First lady of the land, Chao Yang's chatelaine, sits always by her lord, a board or carriage, carriage before which maids with bows and arrows are mounted on white steeds with golden bridles. They look up in the air and loose together, when, what laughter when a pair of wings drop downward, what bright eyes and white teeth, but now where is she? The ghosts of those by blood defiled are homeless. Where limpid river-wise waters flow eastward, one goes, the other stays, and has no tidings. Though pity all our hours, weeping remembers, these waters and these flowers remain as ever. But now brown dusk and horsemen fill the city. To gain the city south, I shall turn northward. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to give this uh, 3.75 out of 5. I enjoyed seeing this poetry from a different culture. And actually, although I tend to not be too much of a fan of sort of old school traditional poetry, I really enjoyed, um, you know, this stuff. And this was from 8th century China as well. So, you know, it was, it was more enjoyable than 18th century British poetry for me, for sure. Okay, next up we have The Fade Out by Edbury Baker and Sean Phillips. So this is a graphic novel. It's set in uh, Hollywood in like the 1940s and sort of, you know, Hollywood's golden era. Uh, we have a character who's a screenwriter. Lots of like sort of noir detective vibes going along here. And um, this has, um, has positive memories for me because I was given this on uh, the first date with uh, the girl who is now my girlfriend. And uh, she picked it out specifically for me and gave me like a little postcard with it as well to talk about, you know, uh, reasons she thought I might like it, which unfortunately isn't in here. So uh, actually I can. So she wrote me a little postcard and said, Dane, just a little note to tell you the reasons for why I chose this comic book. The main protagonist is a writer. It's set in the golden era of Hollywood. It has a murder mystery at the heart of the story. I love the drawing style and thought it had a great front cover. Hope you enjoy. So. Yeah, and I did enjoy it. I gave it a 4 out of 5. So there we go. Alright, up next we have Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury, which I read as a buddy read with Graham Quigley. And yeah, it was good to finally get to it. I think I need to give it another reread just to really kind of wrap my head around some of the different ways that the story is told and the way it wraps back together, you know? But um, I did really enjoy it. It reminded me of The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, except I didn't like that book very much, and I did very much enjoy this. It's probably not my favourite Ray Bradbury book. I also liked how uh, The Illustrated Man was in this as well, and so uh, there were some elements in this story that I knew from Bradbury's other work, which I thought was pretty cool. So, um, yeah, I, I gave this like a 3.75 out of 5, I reckon. Okay, then we have Come Tell Me How You Live by Agatha Christie Mallowan. And that's basically Christie's full name after she remarried. So her first husband was called Christie. Her second one was uh, Mallowan. And he was uh, uh, an archaeologist. And this book is basically about some time that she spent in Syria on archaeological digs with him. Um, so, and basically, yes, yeah, so it says here... Um, Agatha Christie was already well known as a crime writer when she accompanied her husband, Max Mallowan, to Syria and Iraq in the 1930s. She took an enormous interest in all his excavations, and when friends asked what her strange life was like, she decided to answer their questions in this delightful book. Uh, yeah, and it's just it, really interesting, especially if you're a Christie fan or if you're interested in archaeology. I was interested in both, which kind of helped. And I totally recommend this to, say, Brian from Brian's Bookshelves and Mara from Books Like Woe, who are Christie fans. If you're not a Christie fan, this probably isn't the best place to start with her, but uh, certainly one to look out for just because it's, you know, a bit of a curious one, a bit of a historical curio.
Okay, continuing on the Agatha Christie theme for a while, we have Murder is Easy. And um, I've got to be honest, I already don't remember this one too much. Um, I had a bit of a lull with Christie novels recently. And so I kind of got to a point where they all started blending in together. This one didn't particularly stand out to me. Well, I, it's been about a month since I read it and I've just read so many other books. I can't remember it. I'm sorry. But that, I guess I'm going to have to give it a three out of five i'm sure i'd remember if it was any worse than that but okay then we have crooked house by agatha christie and uh oh okay i remember this one so this one was interesting let me read you the blurb here uh, the Leon the leonides were one big happy family living in a sprawling ramshackle mansion that was until head of the household aristide was murdered with a fatal barbiturate injection suspicion naturally falls on the old man's young widow 50 years his junior but the murderer has reckoned without the tenacity of charles hayward fiance of the late millionaire's granddaughter and I think, if I remember correctly, his motivation to try and solve this was that she didn't want to murder. She didn't want to marry him, if um, murder was potentially, you know, within the family or whatever. So he was determined to figure out the truth so that they could get married. And uh, yeah, this one was, I guess, slightly better than Murder Is Easy, but still not her best. I'll give it a three point five out of five. Um, yeah. Then we have Oh La La by Robert Louis Stevenson, which just makes me think of that Rihanna song that's like Oh La La. What's her name? Penguin Mini Little Black Classic number 19. Stevenson's chilling Victorian Gothic novella about decaying aristocracy, vampiricism, and tormented love. And I thought some of the ideas here were good, but I just didn't like the execution much. Um, I, I, I wasn't really gripped by it, you know? But I kind of I kind of respect it for what it was and the time it was written at as well. Um, you know, this is early vampiric lore, really, and so if you're into vampires, you should definitely read this. But I don't think it stands up against, say, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Okay, then we have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I've been recommended this many times. It's always been on my radar, and I was looking out for a used copy but never saw one. Finally picked up a copy. I just ordered it online, and it was a 5 out of 5 for me. Absolutely phenomenal, beautifully written, really haunting when you consider what Plath went through in her life and what the story deals with. If you want to read about mental illness and mental health that's really touching, then for sure get it. But also it was read as like, a, almost, uh, it was reviewed by one of the blurbs as uh, almost like a feminist uh, catcher in the rye, which I think is quite a good uh, uh, quite a good description of it as well. So I think, um, yeah, if, if you're angsty or if you've ever felt angsty, certainly read The Bell Jar. And um, even if not, you know, if you just want to get to know what how people with mental illnesses think, this will, this will help you out. Then we have The Chalk Man by CJ Tudor, which I read with Anthony Andrews. Now, I was expecting this to be more of a kind of a horror, almost with, you know, with a lot of creepiness in it, especially because it's got like, Lee Child said it's wonderfully creepy. There's a blurb on uh, by Stephen King on the front as well. And it turned out to pretty much just be a generic thriller. So I think I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 at the time. Looking back, it's possibly a 3 out of 5. There wasn't really anything memorable about it. Uh, it also jumped between the past and the present and I didn't really care for that I kind of cared about what was happening in the present wasn't interested in the past at all Even though the two ended up tying in, in together and it just it felt very paint by numbers, you know And similarly to drawing a hangman, you know, it just it was very You, you go You know and the, and the uh, chalk figures weren't as creepy as, as I was hoping they would be. So I don't know. Maybe I was a little bit missold on that. But I read that with Anthony Andrews and he had kind of similar feelings to it as well. So who knows? Then we have The Lair of the White Worm by Bram Stoker. This is actually my copy of Dracula's Guest and other weird stories. But Lair of the White Worm makes up the majority of this book. It's kind of... Um, I think it's been called a novella. But it's basically novel length. Uh, written by Bram Stoker who wrote Dracula. And it's kind of reminiscent to like David Icke's theory about like the royal family and presidents and people in power all being people in lizard suits because basically there's this woman who is basically a lizard and um yeah it's i reread this for um the rereadathon 2019 and i will link below to a video where i talked about this it was all right it wasn't as good as i remembered i still gave it a four out of five i won't say any more here because you can check out the full review if you'd like Okay, then we have Rudyard Kipling, The Gate of the Hundred Sorrows. And this is mini black classic number 24. Opium dens, curses, ghostly tombs. These sinister tales of Imperial India made Kipling's name as a writer. Now, I've read The Jungle Book, and that was different to the film and quite dark, but still enjoyable. This was even darker than that. I mean, you have at one point, like, the Indian servant commits suicide because he's so ashamed he feels like he's failed in his duty. And then 
basically the white guys decide to cover up the fact that he committed suicide because they don't want it to bring shame to his family so it's all pretty dark but um yeah really interesting to read these and it's made me want to read some more kipling i would give these a uh, solid four out of five then we have thomas hardy woman much missed number 14 moving elegaic verse set in rural landscapes penned by the grief-stricken hardy after his wife's death and this is actually quite moving i don't again i'm this probably isn't the kind of poetry that i would necessarily enjoy but because i did find it quite moving i'd probably give it a four out of five i'm going to read you here uh, the phantom horsewoman Queer of the ways of a man I know, he comes and stands in a careworn craze, and looks at the sands and the seaward haze, with moveless hands and face and gaze, then turns to go, and what does he see when he gazes so? They say he sees as an instant thing, more clear than today, a sweet soft scene that once was in play, by that briny green, yes notes all way, warm real and keen, what his back years bring a phantom of his own figuring. Of this vision of his they might say more, not only there does he see this sight, but everywhere, in his brain, day, night, as if on the air, it were drawn rose bright. Yea, far from that shore does he carry this vision of heretofore. A ghost girl rider, and though tall tried, he withers daily, time touches her not, but she still rides gaily in his rapt thought, on that shagged and shaly Atlantic spot, and as when first died, draws rain and sings to the swing of the tide. There we go. I mean, sure, it might not be my kind of poetry, but I can appreciate what's being done with language, you know? Here we have The Tomb and Other Tales by H.P. Lovecraft. I actually read this as a bedtime book because it was taking me a while to get into Lovecraft's writing style. I did eventually enjoy it a bit more, but still only gave it like a 3.5 out of 5 at best. I probably will read some more Lovecraft, but I don't know. He's been so hyped up for me and I didn't necessarily enjoy him that much. What I did enjoy in this, though, was that there was a story that he ghost wrote for Harry Houdini and it was written as if it was from uh, you know first person from Houdini which I thought was quite cool uh, and uh, it was interesting that the two of them had that kind of partnership so yeah first uh, first Lovecraft I'm sure it won't be my laugh last but um, yeah Okay, then we have Film It Cuts, Sunshine and Lollipops by Ollie Jacobs. Uh, this was for uh, Tarden Danes, indie read-along, and so I can link to, low, to below to my review of this. This was interesting because even though it's an indie short story collection, and those are quite hard to get published in general, um, and to get people to read them, I found that all the stories really were quite reminiscent, so even now I can remember the first story is kind of what inspired this cover art, and it's about a blogger who develops, you know, they become a zombie during the zombie apocalypse. There was one story about a teacher who kind of gets a visit from the devil, and they're able to have this room that they can punish students in by locking them in, and if they're locked in for five seconds, they become very obedient little students, but any longer and they go kind of crazy. All in all, these are just some great stories, and this is just the first of many of his film It Cuts collections, so I'm looking forward to reading some more of them. And uh, my girlfriend read this one after I read it, actually, and uh, she enjoyed it as well. So, yeah. Although she's currently in hospital, so hopefully she's out of hospital by the time you're watching this. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not good. Okay, up next we have John Keats, The Eve of St. Agnes. This is number 13. The romantic poet's most lyrical, enchanting verse on myth, sensuality, dreams, and superstition. So as always, I shall read you some. They glide like phantoms into the wide hall. Like phantoms to the iron porch they glide. Where lay the porter in uneasy sprawl with a huge empty flagon by his side? The wakeful bloodhound rose and shook his hide. But his sagacious eye an inmate owns. By one and one the bolts full easy slide, the chains lie silent on the foot-worn stones, the key turns and the door upon its hinges groans. Uh, just a 3.5 out of 5 for me, I'm not a massive Keats fan and you know this, not, this didn't really change my opinion one way or the other. Alright then we have Baltasar Gracian, How to Use Your Enemies, number 12. A 17th century Spanish priest's shrewd maxims on using guile and pragmatism to succeed in a dangerous world. And this is surprisingly still accurate today. It's almost like a more modern kind of art of war. And so I really enjoyed it because of that. I'm going to read uh, just a few excerpts. Let's do this one. Get used to the bad temperaments of those you deal with. Like getting used to ugly faces. This is advisable in situations of dependency. There are horrible people you can neither live with nor live without. It's a necessary skill, therefore, to get used to them, as to ugliness, so you're not surprised each time their harshness manifests itself. At first they'll frighten you, but gradually your initial horror will disappear and caution will anticipate or tolerate the unpleasantness. Let me give you one more little bit. Never let compassionate for the unfortunate earn you the disfavour of the fortunate. 
One person's misfortune is normally another's good fortune, for there can never be a lucky person without many unlucky ones. The unfortunate tend to attract the goodwill of people who want to compensate them for fortune's lack of favour with their own worthless favour. And it has sometimes been known for a person who was hated by everyone whilst they prospered to gain everyone's compassion in adversity. Desire for revenge against the exalted turns to compassion for the fallen. But a shrewd person must pay close attention to fortune's shuffling of the cards. Some always side with the unfortunate, sidling up to them in their misfortune, having previously shunned them when they enjoyed good fortune. This perhaps suggests innate nobility, but not an ounce of shrewdness. So yeah, I'm going to give this a pretty solid 4 out of 5. And like I say, if you're into stuff like The Art of War, then you should read that. Then we have Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, a play adapted by Richard R. George. Not much to say here, really, other than that this is... Um, you know, an adaptation of the novel. What I do like is that it came with this. It's actually an, uh, an advanced review copy from 1984. Or 19, yeah, 1984, which I think is very cool. Um, and I guess I'm probably the first person who read it. I did enjoy it. I'll give it a 4 out of 5. It, it's as good as uh, the, the children's book. What I will say as well that is quite cool is that it's specifically published in this format with advice on lighting and stage layout and stuff like that to deliberately make it easier for schools to put on school plays. Then I have Guy de Maupassant, Femme Fatale, number 15. Four sparkling 19th century tales of Parisian high society and rural life from the father of the modern short story. So I studied Guy de Maupassant at university and really enjoyed what I learned then. It was great to go back to him. He really is like the father of the modern short story. So if you're interested in short stories at all, you should give him a read. Uh, I would give this a pretty solid four out of five, but I, I want to read more Guy de Maupassant before I make like a, a full decision on, you know, how I feel about his, his back catalogue. Here we have Unspun Socks from a Chicken's Laundry. This is children's poems by Spike Milligan. I will read you one of the poems to give you a feel. Ode to the Queen and Jubilee Year. Sound the trumpet, bang the drum, shake the tambourine, because this year is a jubilee, but only for the queen. Let us salute her. Yes, let us. Salute her, let us, yes. Hide in Marks and Spencer's knickers with Norman Hartnell dress. So glory, glory, Gloria, Regina Gloriana. You are the apple of my eye. Let me be your banana. First published in Private Eye. There we go. Um, it's like a three out of five. It was all right. I think I enjoyed it more than modern day kids would enjoy it, you know? Here we have Suetonius Caligula, number 17. The original biography of the murderous, crazed, and incestuous Roman Emperor Caligula who pronounced himself a god. I really enjoyed this. I thought the translation was quite well done in terms of it's quite a modern translation, which makes it really easy to read. And it was just interesting to learn more about Caligula. Whether this is the most impartial source or not is up for debate. But yeah, I gave it a 4 out of 5. It was all right. Then we have How to Train Your Viking by Toothless the Dragon, translated from the Dragonese by Cressida Cowell. So this is a World Book Day spin-off of the How to Train Your Dragon books. Didn't even know these were a thing, to be honest. And I gave this one a 4 out of 5 as well, actually. Uh, I have no shame in the fact that I enjoy this series. It just kind of makes me happy. But I like this one in particular because it's written by Toothless, whereas all the others are kind of written and presented as uh, Hiccup's memoirs. So it was just interesting to have that slightly different take on the world, you know? Okay, we have Marco Polo, Travels in the Land of Serpents and Pearls, number 16. The intrepid Venetian traveller's observations of a 13th century India filled with lavish jewels, chaste princes, superstitions and naked armies. And uh, I, I guess I'd never really thought about it, but I didn't know that Marco Polo had particularly written anything that you could read, you know? So it was just pretty cool to go into this. Uh, again, I would like to probably read more. What, what did it say? It was an excerpt from um, his famous Travels. So it's just called The Travels. So I might read The Travels at some point because I think that would be an interesting way to sort of to see the world some more, especially through his eyes in that period of time, you know? All right, then we have another one of these World Book Day things from Cressida Cowell. This is How to Train Your Dragon, The Day of the Dreader. Uh, basically, there's a big dragon called the Dreader. He's very angry, and Hiccup has to save the day. And because it's fairly short, I mean, it's 120-odd pages, so you can read this in, in a day. You can read it in a World Book Day. And again, I think I got it for like 50p or something. So considering, again, I've been reading the, the actual main books in the series, and I didn't know these side books existed, I thought it was worth getting them. Alright, then I have Apollonius of Rhodes, Jason and Medea, number 18. A heroic tale of love, anguish, and the golden fleece from the ancient Greek epic, Argonautica. So, I enjoyed this so much. I mean, I, I still only gave it like a 4 out of 5. It was a great translation. Again, I think, there was I think this was probably just an excerpt, unless it's a very short epic, you know. Um, yes, yeah, so this is taken from E.V. Rio's translation of The Voyage of Argo. 
um, so I would definitely like to read kind of the full version but um, yeah I gave it like a 4 out of 5 and it I enjoyed it so much that I recently rewatched Jason and the Argonauts as well so yeah here we have Goosebumps Attack of the Mutant by R.L. Stein. I, I read and reviewed this as well which I'll link to below this was for the rereadathon and uh, this was a book I used to love as a kid. Listen to it via audio. The audiobook wasn't as enjoyable as an experience because the narrators were kind of quite whiny sounding and annoying. But it, it was still alright and I still got, you know, got through it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't like superhero stuff. But for some reason, I particularly like that Goosebumps book because I read it quite a lot as a kid and I used to reread it, you know. Okay, then we have Vegan on the Go by Jerome Ekmai and Daniela Leis. So this is fast, easy, affordable, anytime, anywhere vegan cooking. And if you've seen any of my cooking, uh, reading vlogs and you see my cooking inside them, you've probably seen me make some of these recipes. So I did this one, for example, that's vegan bratwurst uh, and vegan currywurst. I tried the Mexican pepper salad. That actually didn't work out so well, unfortunately. Juicy mandarin and chia seed muffins. I made those. Baklava, I made that. Caramelized rice pudding. Indian vegetable pancakes. Uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff in here. Courgette cake. So, uh, you know, jackfruit recipes and whatnot. So if you're into plant-based plant cooking uh, and vegan stuff, then definitely check this out. I would give this a pretty solid four out of five. And interestingly... I get, I get this vegan subscription box called the Vegan Kind Box, and they sent me this with this month's box, which is like an abridged, sort of truncated version of that cookbook. So uh, I'm going to give this to my girlfriend so that she has that to make delicious food for me. Almost done. All right. Then we have How to Steal a Dragon Sword by Cressida Cowell. This is one of the actual full How to Train Your Dragon novels. And um, this was interesting because it kind of dives back into the history of Burke, which is the island they all live on, and uh, some of the prophecies and that kind of stuff. And it basically shows how, you know, Hiccup is the chosen one. We have the chosen one trope. I mean, we have to, really. But, uh, yeah, really enjoyable. This one was quite laugh out loud funny a few times. It did also end on a cliffhanger, which is kind of a bummer for me because I've been kind of picking them up out of order as and when I've seen them. So I might actually have to chase down the actual specific next book in the series. But uh, I gave it a, uh, yeah, we'll give it a four out of five. Why not? Yeah, lots of fours this, this, this month. Okay, then we have Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Communist Manifesto, number 20. This revolutionary summons to workers transformed the modern world and still shapes millions of lives today. And I mean... I don't want to go into too much detail on this because I think everyone has sort of opinions on stuff and the word communism is scary. I kind of agree with quite a lot of what's in here, you know, whether that actually translates into real, you know, practicality in the real world, I'm not so sure. I mean, you could argue, I, I would say the same thing about the Green Party, for example. I think that it's a really good thing that we have, you know, political parties that are dedicated spe specifically to dealing with climate change. Whether they'd be equipped to actually run a country or not, I don't know. But I think the idea is certainly sound. And so I think this manifesto in itself gets twisted a lot because people have used it to different ends. But I think there's stuff here that we, we can all learn from. And, uh, and it's certainly, even if we disagree with it, I think it's something everyone should read just to know why they agree and or disagree with it. So um, thinking about it, I'm going to give it a 4.5 out of 5 because it certainly was th thought provoking, if nothing else. Then we have Space Ranger by Isaac Asimov. I have done a full review of this, so I'll link to that below. I gave it a 5 out of 5. It's the first book in his David Starr um, Space Ranger series. And uh, there are six of those available. They were first published under the pseudonym of Paul French. In this one, the first one, uh, he goes to Mars, to some of the farms on Mars, to discover why sometimes people are randomly getting poisoned by food that's been shipped to the Earth from Mars. Definitely recommend it. Then we have Petronius Trimalchio's Feast, number 21. A bitingly comic portrayal of the vulgar Trimalchio and his debauched, drunken Roman banquet from the outrageous Latin masterpiece, The Satyricon. So this is another 4 out of 5 and another book that I need to read in full and I'm sure I will get to it at some point. The plan is basically to read all of the uh, Little Black Classics and then I'll go back through, rank them all from least favourite to favourite and then I'll identify which authors or which books I want to read the full versions of, you know. So here... It was just hilarious. Some of the lines in this. Let me see if I can find that hilarious line. Hang on. No sooner had Menelaus spoken than Trimalchio snapped his fingers. At the signal, the eunuch brought up the pissing bottle for him while he went on playing. With the weight off his bladder, he demanded water for his hands, splashed a few drops on his fingers and wiped them on a boy's head. I mean, that was like on the second page of this. And at that point, I was like, I am going to enjoy this. Like, 
I mean, I know that's wrong on all kinds of levels, but it made for an interesting read, so, you know. All right, up next we have Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, and I recently posted a full review of this, actually, as well, which I'll link to below. This uh, started out as a bedtime book, and, uh, well, it ended up as one as well, but I was really enjoying it by the end. I gave it, uh, I think, a four out of five. Now, my problems with this, really, were the first couple of chapters and the last couple of chapters, because the actual main bulk of this, when he was stuck on the desert island, were really what made the book interesting. And for that, I thought it was interesting from kind of a survival point of view, and so I think maybe Todd the Librarian here on BookTube would enjoy it. Um, it's not for everybody. I know some people have studied it and not enjoyed it as well, but I quite enjoyed it, and uh, I'm glad that I picked it up for sure. Then I have Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Well They Are Gone and Here Must I Remain, number 35. Dreamlike, poignant verse on passion, torment, and resplendent landscapes from one of the first romantic poets. So let's read you a little bit of this. Uh, let's read you uh, Coleridge on love. All thoughts, all passions, all delights, whatever stirs this mortal frame, all are but ministers of love and feed his sacred flame. Oft in my waking dreams do I live o'er again that happy hour, when midway on the mount I lay beside the ruined tower. The moonshine stealing o'er the scene had blended with the lights of Eve, and she was there, my hope, my joy, my own dear Genevieve. She leant against the armoured man, the statue of the armoured knight, as she stood and listened to my lay amid the lingering light. Few sorrows hath she of her own, my hope, my joy, my Genevieve. She loves me best whene'er I sing the songs that make her grieve. I played a soft and doleful air, I sang an old and moving story, an old rude song that suited well that ruined wild and hoary. She listened with a flitting blush, with downcast eyes and modest grace, for well she knew I could not choose but gaze upon her face. I told her of the knight that wore upon his shield a burning brand, and that for ten long years he wooed the lady of the land. I told her how he pined and ah, the deep, the low, the pleading tone, with which I sang another's love, interpreted my own. She listened with a flitting blush, with downcast eyes and modest grace, and she forgave me that I gazed too fondly on her face. But when I told the cruel scorn that crazed that bold and lovely knight, and that he crossed the mountain woods nor rested day nor night, that sometimes from the savage den and sometimes from the darksome shade, and sometimes starting up at once in green and sunny glade. There's loads more to this, so I'm not going to finish it. But yeah, um, three and a half stars for Coleridge. I've been to Coleridge Cottage once as well, and it was enjoyable. Worth, worth visiting if you're in the area. Geoffrey Chaucer, The Wife of Bath, number 28. One of the most famous Canterbury tales casts a satirical eye over sex and marriage in the medieval age. I was impressed by how sort of raucous and scandalous this was, although I'd expect nothing less from Chaucer. He was a bit of a, a dirty man, shall we say. And uh, yeah, having visited Canterbury as well and, you know, been to a few museums on the Canterbury Tales, it was interesting to read this. I would like to read the Canterbury Tales in full at some point. I'm going to give this a pretty solid four out of five. It also has uh, the uh, Wife of Bath prologue as well, which was actually arguably more interesting than the main thing. But uh, yeah, worth a read. Then we have Charles Dickens, The Great Winglebury Jewel, number 37. Two rollicking tales of scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells from the Sketches by Boz that launched Dickens' career. So Sketches by Boz was when Dickens used to write for uh, newspapers. And these there were two stories in this. Uh, the two stories were The Great Winglebury Jewel and The Steam Excursion. Arguably The Steam Excursion was the better of the two, I thought. And uh, this was a five out of five for me. It was really, really funny, just really well written. And it's just really kind of got me wanting to read more Dickens now. I think maybe early Dickens might be my jam. So I want to see if I can get more of the uh, sketches by Boz. I'm going to look into that. Then we have Douglas Adams and John Lloyd, The Deeper Meaning of Lyf, a dictionary of things that aren't that there aren't any words for yet. And that's basically exactly what it is. I'll read you some of the definitions. It's also worth noting that all of the places, all of the uh, words here are real place names as well. So... Uh, let's see. Saffron Walden. Noun. A particular kind of hideous casual jacket that nobody wears in real life, but which is much favoured by Ronnie Barker. Uh, what have we got here? Chicago. Noun. The foul, the foul smelling wind that precedes an underground train. I'll do one more for you to get the gist. Uh, Molesby. Noun. The kind of family that drives to the seaside and then sits in the car with all the windows closed, reading the Sunday Express and wearing Sid Cups. So I gave this like a 3.75 out of 5. I did read this as a bedtime book purely because with something like this that's kind of a reference book, you're not really meant to just sit there and read it as your main book, you know. Uh, this would actually probably go quite well in a bathroom or something like that as well or as like a coffee table book. But yeah, I, I enjoyed it enough. Uh, 3.75 out of 5. And uh, that's one one book closer to me reading all of Douglas's, uh, Douglas Adams' stuff. 
And my battery is running out, but I'm also on my last book. So this is Blueprint for Revolution. How to use Lego men, rice pudding, and other non-violent techniques to galvanize communities, overthrow dictators, or simply change the world by Sergio Popovich and Matthew Miller. This is non-fiction. I have filmed and uploaded a review for this, although I might not have posted it by the time you're seeing this. We'll see. But uh, I'll link to that below either way, and you can always watch it on Unlisted, because it really is quite an interesting book. I gave it like a 3.75 out of 5, because there were a few issues. It kind of repeated itself from time to time. It could have done potentially with some better editing. It actually felt more like a series of individual essays than a kind of cohesive non-fiction book. But having said that, if you're interested in kind of peaceful protests and revolutions and all that sort of stuff, definitely check about check it out. I mean, he was uh, he he ran a, a movement called uh, Art Poor, which uh, helped to overthrow uh, Slobodan Milosevic from uh, Serbia. So that's pretty cool. So yeah, pretty pretty solid 3.75 out of five for me. And this was actually bought for me by Bex as well. She wrote um, for this one. She wrote. The reason for why I have bought you this book is very simple. As well as random acts of kindness, the world also needs small acts of rebellion. By avoiding violence and using a sense of humour, we all could change the world. Hope you enjoy, Bex. And I think that's a nice little message to leave this uh, video on. So, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.